Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to TTP 201, Applied Data Analysis. Um, hopefully everyone got the announcements, um, but if not, uh, please go ahead and download R and R Studio um, before we begin. Um, the, first, <laughs> the first couple of classes, we're gonna do some tutorials in, in R to get everyone familiar because that's what we're gonna be working with. Um, in, in this course. And then throughout the rest of the quarter, um, generally the way this is gonna work is I'll do kind of whiteboard lectures for the first half. And then um, we'll do sort of application of what we learned immediately in R and I'll show everyone how to do the coding. Um, so most students have found it uh, useful in the past to kind of like follow along. So I'll encourage people to kind of be on their computers um, and follow along as, as we go through. Okay, more seconds. Okay, so quickly before we begin, I'm just gonna go through some of the class logistics really quickly. Um, you guys are all here, so uh, don't really need to um, tell you about this, but you know, we're here Tuesdays, Thursdays. Um, so office hours, so my office hours are gonna be on Wednesdays from 10 to 11. I'm gonna be doing it uh, by Zoom. Uh, so that'll be kind of open for everyone. Uh, if you do wanna meet in person, I'm fine with that as well. You'll just have to kind of schedule with me separately. Um, Vaish, where are you? Okay, Vaish is gonna be our TA um, for this quarter. She took the class, what, two years ago? Something like that? 2019, oh my God, three years ago. Um, yeah, it's been a while and some things will be a little, little bit different, but she's, she will also be uh, doing um, office hours on Mondays uh, and same deal with uh, Vice, she'll, she'll also be available to me in, in person. And you can sort of message us via Canvas or uh, you can email me or Vice. I didn't put your email down, but maybe you can like post it on Canvas. Okay, um, so COVID protocols. Uh, so officially we have no more um, masking policy. Um, and however, I'm still gonna be masking. I encourage anyone um, who wants to do so to, to do that as well. Um, yeah, so no, no sort of strict mas masking policy now, uh, but you do have to still get tested every two weeks, make sure that you do your daily symptom surveys before you come to campus and then don't come to campus if you're sick. Um, yeah, goes without saying. Um, so I'm not doing like hybrid mode lectures, but I will be recording the lectures, um, hence, the, hence the webcam. Um, so if you miss anything, you can watch it on YouTube, but I'm still sort of expecting everyone to attend in person. Any questions about that so far? Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay. Uh, schedule overview, This all of this stuff is in the syllabus already, so you can kind of review that. The sort of one big difference for this quarter compared to um, when I've taught it in the past is we're going to do a little bit deeper dive into R. So there's three classes of sort of tutorial. Um, and that's kind of to help sink in and replace the ECI 254, um, which is a requirement for a lot of TTP students. But um, it'll be useful anyways, because everything that we're going to be doing is going to be uh, in, in R anyways. Um, so it'll be a, a refresher for those of you who are already familiar with R. Um, but for those of you who aren't, um, hopefully this, this will be a, a good way to, to get started. Um, yeah, and then we're gonna cover uh, basically lots of different types of data analysis methods. Um, this is definitely a more of an applied class than a theoretical class. You can kind of complement a lot of what we learn in this class with um, something like an econometrics class in econ, or regression class in, in statistics, but we're not gonna be doing proofs and, and theory. It'll mainly be um, learning the sort of method and applying it to use in real data. Okay. 
homeworks, 50% of the grade. There's going to be four assignments throughout the quarter. Um, this, uh, this class requires that you submit a, an R markdown file and a PDF or HTML of the compiled uh, markdown. So if you don't know what that means yet, don't worry. We're going to go through this um, next week. Uh, but but basically, this is going to be a, a way to sort of ease the burden for, for Vaish because she can actually be able to just run your code um, uh, in, in case things kind of aren't lining up in the sort of compiled file. So just keep that in mind. Um, okay, and then the final project is worth 30% of the final grade. For those who have taken my classes before, this is kind of a pretty standard thing, right? So we'll have a project proposal, presentation, and a report, and the due dates are there. And we'll talk more about the, the projects um, down the line. But what I'll say now is start, even sort of at the beginning, think about things that you might be interested in. Um, data analysis wise, if you have kind of an interesting data set, um, you can start thinking about what sorts of uh, projects you might wanna um, consider, consider doing. Um, okay. Questions? Yes. Oh, no. So projects are going to be in groups. Um, so we're going to want probably two to three people per group. And, and that way, um, everyone will have kind of time to present during the, the sort of final weeks. Um, hopefully, we're kind of aiming for like 12 to 15-ish groups, which means, yeah, most people will have to do two or three. OK. Uh, any questions about any of this? Great. All right, well, so we're going to just, oh, sorry, I missed you. Go ahead. Uh, it'll just be by sort of people coming to class and we'll kind of have a, Vaish is going to keep an eye out on all of you. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and jump over to our studio. Okay. So let me rid of this guy over here and start a new project. Oh, this mouse is very laggy on the screen. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Oh, let me turn off this light. So this is the our studio um, interface. Uh, so hopefully everyone has this ready to go. Does, has anyone had any problems setting this up? No, okay. So let me kind of describe the layout here. Um, so this is kind of the workspace notebook area. Um, this is the console area. Um, and then these two, um, are sort of uh, areas that, that uh, so the top one, you can look at the storing of all of the variables um, sort of on, on the platform in, in the space that you have currently loaded. Uh, and then this is kind of a navigator to basically, uh, if you plot things, if you wanna do file navigation, um, if you do like help command to look at how functions work, all of that information will sort of come up here. And uh, or we'll, we'll see how this is kind of um, um, being used in, in just a second. Okay. So if you think about like using a calculator, sort of this bottom left area is where you can sort of enter commands um, and, and run them. And so if I wanna say one plus two, 
um, and hit enter, right? Then it will perform that operation. Um, if you want to be able to kind of store that, what you can do is up in the editor area, I can enter that same information, uh, one plus two here. And I can go ahead and run that line and it will send that command out into the console, as you can see below, uh, and execute it. So keeping stuff in your editor area allows you to um, essentially save any sort of work that you're doing. Okay, and so basics of this, uh, I can do addition, I can do multiplication, so two times three. Um, so a quick shortcut, instead of having to move my cursor over and clicking run every time uh, on a Mac, you can press command enter. And on uh, Windows, you can do control enter. And that will execute the line that your sort of cursor is currently uh, on. So if I do that, two times three, great, six. I can do some multiplication. Uh, and I can also do exponentiation, three to the fourth power, uh, command enter, and get 81. Great. Okay. Um, so, so far, so good. You can do a lot of sort of these basic operations. Um, now we'll talk about one of the sort of critical pieces uh, in, in, of working uh, in this space. So X arrow two. Um, so what does this do? So I can execute this and you can see down here in the council, it's just executed it, but sort of nothing has really happened. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is we're passing information to R to actually store um, a variable. Okay, and so we have assigned the value to, um, to the value X. Uh, and you can actually see in the far, in the top right hand side, I now have this extra variable X here. So don't worry about those top three. That's just uh, some default stuff that I have on my computer. You won't see that, um, but you will see this X2 here. And what I can do is if I go into the council and I hit X, enter, uh, then you'll have, um, it'll return the value that's stored under X. Does that make sense for everyone? Okay, so um, I'm gonna note here, okay, so we'll say storing variable values. Um, so I'm just making a comment in the editor. So um, all the notes that I take during class, I'm gonna post onto Canvas. Um, so if you kind of fall behind, uh, don't worry about it. We can, uh, you, you'll be able to, to find everything um, posted back on Canvas after class. Um, so on line five, I have uh, the pound symbol, and then I have this note kind of saying storing variable values. So the pound symbol is the way that you make comments um, in the editor. And so if I were to, let's say, accidentally run this line, um, Nothing will nothing will happen um, because of the comment. If you were to do this and run this, you're going to get all sorts of crazy errors. It says so unexpected symbol in storing variable. Um, we actually have not defined an object called storing or called variable or called values, and so it doesn't know what to do. Um, so if you're doing comments, make sure to do that. Um, okay. So let me go to the console and I'm gonna put X here, big X. What do you guys think is gonna happen? Anyone? 
It's not going to know what it is. Object X was not found. Okay, so R is case sensitive. Um, so everything within the platform, if you're doing variables, functions, any sort of defined object, uh, it will be sensitive to capitalization. Okay. And so keep that in mind. Um, that can be a common source of, of these errors. Um, and yeah, so these, these two errors that we see are going to be sort of um, common things that might show up for you. Um, and one of, one, of the, um, one of the things that you'll have to learn is to be able to sort of diagnose errors. And so in, in both of these cases, these just mean that you haven't kind of defined the object, right? We don't have it kind of stored. It doesn't know what to look for. Um, okay. So one common question people have. So if you're coming from other coding languages, um, assignment, uh, can usually be done in this way, where you have an equals instead of an arrow. Um, so these are actually almost equivalent um, in R. So you can do this. There are some very particular edge cases which you will never run into, I, I almost guarantee, um, where um, and, and besides those edge cases, these, these two are essentially equivalent. Um, however, proper practice in, in R kind of suggests people do the first one rather than the second, just to kind of avoid that um, corner case. But for me, I'll also make that suggestion because it also helps uh, distinguish between um, something that else that you're going to do uh, very often, which is equal equals. Um, so equals and equal equals are two different uh, operators in R. Um, so equals with one is an assignment operator, which is doing the same thing as the arrow. Equals equals is a check. So it's going to do a Boolean uh, return which means just a true or false to see if the two values on both sides are equal. So if, if I do this equals equals, it's going to be true because we've assigned X to be two. And so it checks that value and it returns true. If I did, uh, let's say is three equal to two, it is not, right? And if X is X equal to three, um, it is not. Uh, one of the most common mistakes is doing one equals when you're doing this kind of check sign, which is an assignment. Um, and you can like override your variable, you reassign it to something new, which is something you want to avoid. And so, yeah, best practices in R is to use the arrow for your assignment operator. Okay. Any questions about that? We're going to make a second variable here called y, uh, and I'm going to give it um, the value 3. OK, and so now if I do x plus y, um, what do you think is going to happen? What are we going to return here? 5. Great. Yep. Um, so uh, you can call in objects, you can perform operations on them. Uh, okay, and so here, why don't I try something like this? So X, uh, I'm gonna assign X as three, and then I'm gonna run X plus Y again. And so here, now x plus y is equal to six. So I have overridden the, the previous assignments of two to a new value of three. And so now when I do x plus y equals six. Um, yeah, and so 
objects that are stored can be overridden. Um, that's an important concept and uh, can be sort of a pitfall for people if you uh, accidentally overwrite, uh, overwrite variables. Okay. One of the most, so we're gonna be talking specifically about functions and, and how they work in a little bit, um, but sort of even before I get there, I'm gonna kind of introduce um, this one function. So generally the way functions work are that you have the function name and then an input into that function, and then it gives you some kind of output. Um, the concatenate is actually a function, um, and this does something uh, particular. Um, so it's, it's probably one of the most common and powerful tools uh, that, you'll, that you'll be doing, uh, that you'll be using. Um, and all this does is it allows you to create a vector of values. And so, so far we've been dealing with sort of one number at a time, and this is what will allow you to kind of look at things in a vector. So if I return this, it'll be one, two, three, four. Um, okay, and so that's how you kind of um, store uh, numbers together. So what we'll do here is I'm gonna create a couple of vectors and store them. So X1, as one, two, we'll have X2 also as one, two, and we'll have X3 as one, two, three. Um, there's a shortcut for this as well if you just want to go numerically. Um, so it would look like this. So it would be X3 as one colon three. <clears throat> and that <clears throat> colon just creates a vector between any two numbers, any two integers. Okay, so let me highlight this and I'll go ahead and run that. Um, yeah, and again, as you can see, sort of on the top right-hand side as we're moving through this tutorial, every time I'm creating objects, they're gonna get stored over there um, in the value so you can easily see what's in your, uh, currently stored in your workspace. Okay. So let's do vector operations, X1 minus X2. So it's gonna be the vector one, two minus the vector one, two. Um, and that's going to return zero, zero. It takes the first elements of the first vector, subtracts the first element of the second vector. That'll be the first uh, element in your new uh, vector return. And then the second element will be the second element of the first vector minus the second element of the second vector. Uh, hence, you get zero, zero. Um, Okay, let me do x3 minus x2. What do you guys think is going to happen? So actually, you're not going to get an error. Um, yeah, so let's, let's take a look. So you will get a warning, which is different from an error. Okay, so uh, let me talk about the distinction. So an error will halt any sort of compilation of code and it, it basically stops and says, okay, I don't know how to do this. A warning um, executes the code fully and it will say, hey, you know, you did something weird and this might not be what you're looking for, okay? So it's good to pay attention to these uh, messages. Okay, so we've got the values zero, zero, two. So X3 is the vector one, two, three. 
and then x1 or sorry x2 is the vector 1 2 so what the heck happened so the first two entries are what you would expect it's 1 minus 1 and then 2 minus 2 uh, the third entry gets weird because what happens is it gets to the third element of your x3 vector, which is three, and then it loops back around for x2 back to the beginning um, with one. So three minus one is two. Is that what we wanted to happen? I, I don't know. It's, you're doing a, you know, a length three vector minus a length two vector. Um, but this is how R deals with that issue. So keep that in mind. If you are messing around with vectors that have sort of different properties, you might run into this thing. Um, yeah. Okay, actually, give me one second. Ignore that. Okay. So you can also do other sorts of operations um, with the vectors. What about if I did X2 minus X3? going the other way um, it's going to do uh, it's going to do the same thing right but once you get to the third element it's going to loop back around to the first one for the shorter vector and so now it's going to be one minus three so you get a negative two here instead so every time um, every time you run to the end of the vector and there's nothing left it will kind of loop back to the beginning I can do other operations here as well. So x1 times x2. And if I run that, uh, hopefully intuitive, one times one, two times two, and then you have one and four. And then x2 times x3. Um, same intuition here. First two entries and then shorter one will loop back around. So one times three. Uh, I can also do division. So x1 divided by x2, 1, 1. And then you can also do scalar multi multiplication. So if I, if I multiply a vector by a scalar, it will multiply the scalar across all entries of that vector. It's almost like you are multiplying by, I mean, you are, it's, it's a, it's a vector of length one, right? And it just keeps going back to the first element and looping. Um, but you're not going to get a warning in this case because this is like a common enough thing, right? To, to multiply against the scalar. Um, so matrix operations. Okay, so we're not really gonna run into this, but this is kind of just for your uh, edification. So if, yeah, if you're doing like linear algebra or something and you're like, wait, I wanna actually do the cross product of, of, of two vectors, you can do that. Um, it's a little bit different. So instead of a just straight up um, star for multiplying, it's a percent asterisk percent to indicate that you want to do like a cross product. Um, so you end up with this value um, five. And 
but again, this this is not something that you will really need to deal with in, in this class. But uh, if you want to take a row vector, which is kind of default how it's laid out, um, and you want to turn it into a column vector, which will put it into officially this like matrix dimensions, which we'll get into a, a, a little bit later, um, then you can use T for transpose. Okay. Um, and that will, um, oh, sorry, default is column and it'll turn it into a, into a row vector. Uh, yeah, so it'll look something like this. Um, but again, you don't need to worry about that for now. Um, so I mentioned uh, that we'd be looking at functions. And so we've already actually looked at two functions, the C for concatenate and T for transpose. Um, and if you don't know what a function does, you can always use uh, the help function. Um, actually, I wonder if I can do this. Help, tell me what help does. Great, it, it does work. Okay, so like I was mentioning before, um, the sort of bottom right side is this handy area that lets you, um, kind of lets you look at a bunch of different things, including um, help function stuff. So this is kind of what it looks like here. Um, so this is the standard R documentation for help. Um, it'll tell you basically how to use it. Um, so as I mentioned, all functions basically have inputs and then uh, have some sets of outputs. Uh, so here, um, this part tells you basically how to use it and what all the inputs are. So topic, um, you could do topic equal something, package equal something, and you can set a bunch of options for your help function. Um, and if you want more details about what each of those sort of terms are, uh, that's sort of spelled out um, down here below. And then they have, you know, descriptions and notes and stuff. And the nice thing is sort of at the bottom, it will give you some examples of kind of how to use the function. So if we went ahead um, and let's do, uh, help C, which is that concatenate function, um, or sorry, combine function, um, this will tell you, right, what that function is doing. So combining values into a vector um, or a list. Okay, any questions? We'll take a quick pause here or confusions. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to walk through a couple sort of basic helper functions. A lot of these are going to be, you know, I've selected most of these functions to be um, things that I think will be useful in everyday use, um, both for this class and for potentially whatever data analysis that you'll be doing in the future. Okay, so ls um, is a very handy function. Um, so what I'll do is go ahead, command enter. Um, whoa, what is this? Interesting, okay, sorry, hang on. Uh, ah, that's interesting. Why does that not show up here? Um, okay, what do, what do you guys see when you put ls? Yes. Um, okay, so what ls does is it's, uh, I believe it's called the list function, let me just, or no, not list function, um, list objects function. 
So what LS does is it shows you all the things that you have currently stored in your workspace. Um, and so for most of you guys, right, we, what, what have we defined? We've defined X, Y, X1, X1, X, X3. Um, so those are the five things that, could, that should show up um, when, you, when you do LS. Okay, mine, I'm, I'm a little confused about what's going on here. Um, so I recognize these variables. Um, so yeah, I have no idea why these are showing up because normally everything that you see here is gonna be showing up over there. Uh, those top three values there, um, so you can create a, uh, a sort of personalized profile I won't, I won't get into this because um, in, into how, how, how to do this. Um, you guys can kind of look on that on your own if you want. But, but basically, you know, if you want like, if you want to preload things into your R every time you open a new workspace, you can create this profile and it'll, it'll do that for you. So those are three that I sort of personally have because those are like paths that go to like models that I'm running. And I don't want to have to like reload those paths every time. Um, and so for me, those, those should show up in the LS every time, sort of by default. Um, I don't know why these are showing up here and not there. That's very confusing, but I guess uh, we get weird things sometimes. Um, OK, next up uh, is. RM. So RM is the remove function. Um, so what this will do is it will kind of remove it from the workspace. So if you wanted to get rid of um, X, X1, X2, you can, you can do those by saying RM X. Um, and running it. And what you'll see is that now it no longer appears in my values on the top right hand side. If I type X here, uh, object X not found, I've kind of undefined it by removing it. And when I do LS, um, X is no longer in that list. So let me see what happens if I just get rid of some of these guys. I'm the real me. Yeah, all right. So they're getting removed. Um, great. Another function to look at. Oop, let me do this up in the editor. So mean lets you take um, the average of a set of uh, set of values. So you put in a vector. Um, okay. So here, let me put x three. So what is the mean of my vector one two three? And I run that, and the answer is two. Okay. Um, however, let's do let's do this. One, two, three. All right. Don't hit enter. What do you think is going to happen? Two. We have maybe. Uh, brave volunteer saying two. Um, actually, we got one. What the heck just happened here? Yes. Can you ignore the second or third input? Yes, that is exactly what happened. So, um, uh, you, this is where people have to be careful about your function inputs. Okay. Uh, in this t in this function, mean x3, how many objects did I put into the function? One. How many objects did I put into this function? Three. Okay, so the mean function, the way it works is it takes a single object 
and it takes the average of that object. Okay, and so these are not the same thing. I can do mean C one, two, three. Okay, and that C, you put a function inside of a function and the, and the inner function will take multiple objects and put them into a single combined vector. And so then this will see one object getting put in. Okay, so there's an important distinction that's happening here and you get the answer that you expect. Um, so this is kind of more as of a general principle um, whatever, whenever you're like running code and you're like, ah, it's, it's not, it's not doing what I want it to do. Okay. That the, 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 the compiler, right. The code is always right. Okay. Uh, if it's not doing what you want, then, you know, the coding, you have to fix the coding somehow because the, the, uh, the code isn't written to do what you're trying to, to, to get it to do here. Um, so there are sometimes these counterintuitive things that might happen. You have to be careful um, uh, about how you're, you're coding it. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, how would I remove everything from the environment instead of just one element? Yeah. Um, I can put it outside. Yeah. Uh, no, I've 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 done that before. Um, there's some kind of yeah command to do that. Um, Oh yeah, 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 yes, right. So okay, um, that's a that's a clever way of doing this, right? Okay, so um, ls returns all the objects that are stored. Rm removes anything, any you know set of objects. Um, I believe you can remove vectors, right, um, of, of objects. So let's see what happens. If I, uh, no. Yeah. So I, something like this. So you can look in the help settings to see. Um, so this, yeah, I think this, this, this will work. Um, yes. Yes, you can. Uh, so this broom, um, yeah, I, I actually don't use RStudio, um, but this broom clears objects from the workspace. So if you want to use the, the interface um, to do that, you can do that as well. Um, okay, so this, uh, so this can be a handy tool, right, to kind of clear space and, and that sort of thing. Um, so what I'm going to mention actually, um, so if you are ever working on projects that use like big data, uh, that stuff gets stored into memory and maybe you'll want to um, clear up some memory um, by removing it. So you can, you can use this function to do so. Um, but sometimes I'll also recommend um, after you do something like that, uh, so it's it's not stored in the workspace anymore, but it's it's sitting as sort of unallocated memory on your computer. And so uh, GC is a function. I think it's like gar called garbage cleanup, um, something like that, that will clear off the memory as well. Um, so R will sort of intermittently do this on its own when it's doing certain types of operations, but you can manually force it to do this. Um, so whenever you remove like a really big object, I recommend uh, just running GC to clear out the memory. These are just kind of handy tricks for, the, uh, it'll be unnecessary for this class, but if you ever are doing anything with big data, um, these 
these sorts of operations um, are are more necessary. Um, okay, a couple other things. So length. Um, so hopefully a lot of these are, are kind of intuitive. Um, so if I want to see how long a vector is, uh, x3, um, what's going to happen if I hit enter? Oh, what? Yes. Yes, uh, exactly. We've cleared all the objects from the workspace. So it's like, what the heck is x3? So let me go back up here. Um, actually, I'm just going to. I'm just going to run everything. There we go. Maybe. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm like, rerun everything and then remove it. Okay. Great. So if I look at the length, um, it will return three. Uh, this can be really handy if you want to look at like really big objects and you don't want to like print it out. Um, this is a, a nice way of doing that. Um, so analogously, uh, you have something called n row and n col. So that's the number of rows and number of columns. We haven't started talking about uh, data frames and matrices and that sort of thing yet. Um, but know that these two functions are similar to length in principle, where you're able to look at essentially the dimensions of, um, of like a table-like object. Max, um, hopefully intuitive as well. So the max of x3 and the min of x3 they're going to look through your vector and determine what the largest value is and what the smallest value is. Okay, um, another handy function is called sample. Um, so Sample is basically, I can take a vector of values and I can basically sample from it, okay? So imagine I have like this little box here, I put in a piece of paper for one, two, three, and I can pull, pull out something. Um, so actually, let me, let me make a new variable. Let's do x, oops, one to 100, okay? So I now have an, a vector um, with the numbers one through 100 in it. And um, the sample will have, this is gonna be our first kind of function where we're gonna have more than one input. So function inputs, um, x comma n comma replace. So let's just do the first two. So I'm gonna say um, X for the thing that I'm drawing from, and then N, the number of draws that I'm gonna have, um, N equals 50. And let's just run it like this for now. Oh, oh it's not N, hang on. It is size. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's going to be a couple things to talk about here, but let me do this first. Okay. So basically what has happened here is that I've taken my box, I have my hundred numbers in here and I'm gonna pull out 50 of them. Okay, and then I'm, put, I'm put them in, putting them into a list. Um, let me quickly do 
this. So we're going to do 101. OK, so what's going to happen here? So if I hit Enter, error. OK, so I've taken my box. I put in 100 numbers, and I tried to draw numbers out of it 101 times. So I'm going to run out of draws. Yes? Can you put a minus there? Oh, God dang it. <laughs> All right, different error. Um, so, okay, well, we, this is instructive, I guess, kind of. Error here, object size not found. I tried to do size minus 101 instead of size equals 101. So I tried to do this operation where I take size minus 101. It says size isn't a thing. I don't know what to do. Uh, this one is what I meant to do, which is try to take 101 draws out of the box that only has 100 numbers. Can't take a sample larger than the population. One replace equals false. So there's an additional argument here that I can add. Uh, replace, which is by default false. And if I do this, uh, it will now um, draw with replacement. So what it does is I now have my box of 100 numbers. I pull out a number, and then I put it back into the box, and then I draw it again. So now you can have repeating values. And you can see with 101 draws, we are guaranteed to at least have one repeating value, right? And so somewhere here, ah, we have two 100s, at least one, right? There's probably more. It's prob probabilistically, it's very, uh, very high. It's like the, uh, the birthday problem. Do you guys know about that? How many people in a room before two people have the same birthday? So there's a... 50% chance that two people in this class have the same birthday, at least 50% once you get to 21 people. So someone here has the same birthday as someone else, but we don't know who. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna pause here for a second. There's a couple kind of nuances um, going on here. Um, okay, good, and I have that brought up. Uh, yes. Okay. So here we can see this usage. Um, and uh, each of these objects, x, size, replace, and prob, are um, inputs into the function. Um, you'll notice something different about the first two compared to the second two. So the second two have these equals with some value defined there. And what that means is that when you call this function, you don't actually have to put in those inputs. By default, these two um, will have the false and null as its default inputs. And if you want to change that, you can specify that sort of explicitly. Um, so the first thing is that it has the X and the size. And so um, when you put in, um, when you put in an argument into the function, uh, let me actually change this to, Z instead of X. I could just do Z comma 50. Um, and it will know sort of in the order of what's sort of shown in the usage that those are the inputs for the X input and the size input. So if I run this, no problem. Um, 
you can explicitly say what you want. Uh, x equals z, sorry, x equals z, and size equals 50. And that will do the exact same thing as the first line. Um, dang it, I did it again. Right, okay. So, so the first and the, the, so line 58 and line 59 are effectively the same thing. Um, it's generally good practice to do what I'm showing in line 59 compared to 58. Um, it, it just helps to sort of understand exactly what's going on, especially in more complicated functions. Um, and the other thing is that uh, if you do this, okay, so if we do 50 comma Z, let's say you forgot the order, right? That, um, that you're supposed to put uh, objects into the, the function. So this is not gonna work. Um, it's gonna return 40, I don't even know what the heck's going on there. <laughs> um, but if you do size equals 50, X equals Z out of order, um, it doesn't matter because it's um, because it knows that you're assigning the, the right thing to each you know specified argument. So in this case, so line 60 doesn't really work um, because it's out of order, but in 61, you're out of the sort of default order, but, but because you've done the correct sort of assignment, that still works. Okay, is this confusing to anyone? Okay. Great. Um, so I so the last thing that I'll say about this is um, I still have my x stored. Um, so I can do. Oops. So the reason why I change it to z is because of this. Um, the name of the like object uh, input here is X, but my object is also called X. So it's like, uh, take the, um, take the name that it's expecting and then put in the kind of same thing. So this, this actually works. Um, but it's confusing and kind of generally bad practice, although I find myself doing this a lot. Um, so in, in this case, you, the, the name expected in the function and the object name are the same thing. And that's generally just not great practice because it can get confusing. You're doing uh, this thing called polluting the namespace. Um, so, just do as I say, not as I do, try and avoid this when possible. Okay. Let's do rep. Um, also a pretty useful function. This is called repeat. Oh yeah, RStudio does this nice little thing for you. Um, I forget about this. Okay, cool. So uh, the this is one of the nice things about working in the R Studio interface, um, particularly if you're newer to R. Um, as you kind of type through um, some commands, like it can give these help, these little helpful autofill functions, um, where it gives you a list of possible functions as you type out you know, these letters. Um, and instead of having to call the help function every time, it actually will just tell you um, kind of what it does and what, what the sort of primary inputs are. Um, okay, so rep. So what is this? 
So this function is called repeat. So I'm going to put in five and let's say 10. Um, okay, let's do this with good practice. And I don't remember all the names here, so I'm just going to look it up real quick. So x equals, oh, they don't even, oh, times, okay. Okay, so rep x equals five times equals 10. So this is going to repeat the value five, 10 times. Okay, so now I've created this vector, five, 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 five. great. Um, easy enough. I can also do this to a vector. So let's take x3, oops. Um, so x equals x3 times equals, and let's repeat that four times. Great. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. We repeated the vector four times and then put it into a single vector. I can also do something like this. So instead of just repeating the vector four times, I can repeat each value of the vector four times. So instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, I get one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 three. Um, okay, so nice, simple enough. And I can even do this. I can do both times and each. And so this will do one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 four times. Um, yeah, and this can be, depending on what you're doing, actually surprisingly useful. Um, I don't do this like super often, but when I do, it's a very helpful kind of function. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. This is the other reason why uh, it's a good practice to do the arrow versus the equals. So, um, yeah. Let me let me see here. So. There is an important distinction here. Okay, so I'm gonna run, run line 66. Okay. And Okay, so I've explained that if you do something like this, x equals x3, you assign the value x3 into the object x. And that kind of looks like what's happening in the function. Okay, but it's, but that's, that's not um, that's not actually what's happening here. Um, inside of a function, things happen slightly differently, and and actually, there, we're going to get a little bit deeper on that in just a second. But uh, this is not your traditional assignment operator when you are doing um, function uh, assignment. Okay, so this is going to say. Um, uh, let me okay let me let me come back to this in just a second okay um we're actually in 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 a real we're, we're gonna talk about this more deeply like right now um and i think the logic behind this particular question is gonna follow more easily once i kind of discuss this okay so we have talked about a whole sort of suite of, of functions. Um, okay, actually, before I get there, sorry, let me let me finish up with a couple more functions and then we'll we'll revisit that. 
Okay, so there's just a, a handful more of these guys um, that are useful. Um, okay, so I, I've, I've shown you guys this colon shortcut type of thing. One to 25, for example, returns a vector one to 25. Um, there is a more sort of formalized way of doing this called sequence, so SEQ. Um, so this lets you do uh, build sequences, vectors of variables. Um, so to do the same thing, I'll go from equals one to equals 25. And you can see that it will also build uh, one to 25. But this function is way more powerful um, because I can do increments. So by three. So one, four, seven, ten. Um, I can do the same thing in, in smaller increments. Um, <clears throat> by 0.25. So then it'll go from 1 to 25 in increments of 0.25, 1, 1.25, 1 1.5. I can go the other way, sequence from 25 to equals 1. Oh, hang on. Uh, and it will run backwards from 25 to one. So sequence is also a very useful tool for creating these vectors. Um, let me make a vector. So, Let's see. Um, let's just do this. Okay. So that's the vector one, one, one. One, two, 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 three, 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 repeated a bunch of times. Um, uh, let's say I just want to look at the unique values of that vector. I can do that pretty easily. One, two, three. This is a really, really helpful function. I use this all the time, every day, basically. If you're like looking at like a survey, with like 10,000 people and there are like five choices and you wanna look at the choices, right? You could use unique. Um, it, it's gonna pull out all the sort of non-repeating values. Um, there are endless examples of where this is useful. Um, let's see. Okay, so the last one that I, okay, I'm not going to talk about these um, or show examples of these yet. Um, we'll show examples of these a little bit later once we're dealing with tables, data frames, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but these are handy functions to know summary and structure, str. Um, these will um, allow you to look at uh, and summarize, you know, any sort of size data data frame or, or, or table um, into sort of useful information. So summary will give you a bunch of like summary statistics, the min, the max, the median, first and third court, um, uh, quantiles, uh, and then the mean um, for every single like column in a table. And then structure will tell you all about the sort of data types, which we haven't covered yet, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, Next class. Um, okay. So we've just gone through a whole bunch of 
kind of helpful functions, hopefully. Um, I think that you guys will be finding yourselves using many, if not all of these uh, throughout this class or um, in your sort of future applied data stuff that you might be doing. Um, but one of the really nice things about R and, you know, and honestly, most programming languages is maybe there's some kind of functional thing that you want to do that doesn't exist in its own sort of uh, package. And so you can actually build your own functions. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to do that right now. So building custom functions. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a function to do the same thing that the mean function does. We're going to build a function that takes averages. So um, the way this is done is through an object assignment. So you can name your function whatever you want it to be. So my function is going to be called I'm the real mean. OK, and so you define this here like so. OK, so function input. Um, so this isn't like Python. Um, so like the it's not uh, it's not operating based off of white space. Um, so for those who are familiar, so like the spacing um, doesn't doesn't really matter. This is more um, as a sort of good practice to kind of kind of see um, what things are in the function essentially. So that's why I'm doing this indent. Um, here, I just, I'm just going to have one input. So it's going to work like the mean, the original mean object or mean function, um, where it takes one object into its input. When you build your own function, you can have more than one input. But for the purposes of what we're doing, we don't need to have more than one input. Um, so it could be like input one, input two, and so on and so forth. Like the, the way rep works, right? Like they had, um, what did they have? X and times and each, right? So it would have been something like this, rep, or sorry, X times each as the inputs. Uh, okay, quick note. Like what I'm doing when I'm writing here, do not do that. Do not overwrite the, the base functions. You're just going to cause a giant headache for yourself. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm the real mean. Um, okay, so someone help me out here. How do I take the average of an object? Okay, I get past the numbers one, two, three, four. How do I take the average? Okay, so sum them up. All right, so we're going to do that. So first, I'm going to define something called x, and I'm going to go sum of the input. Okay, I probably didn't even talk about the function sum, but hopefully you guys can figure that out, right? Um, okay, what do I do now? Divide by the what? Number of values, which is, and how do we do that? The length, right? We, we learned about this function. Okay, so length. So y is length of input. Okay, and now I have the sum of them, and then I have the length, and I divide those two together. Z is x divided by y return z so return um so i've actually defined three values in my function x y and z like which one do, does do you want coming out of the function uh i want z so return will stop the execution of the function uh and return whatever you tell it to, to put there great and so there is our sort of first easy function. So I'm the real mean. 
you'll notice in the top right, I have this function defined now um, as a different sort of uh, object. Um, it is a function object, and you can see how, uh, what inputs it would take. Okay, so um, it doesn't like execute the function or anything, you've just defined it. So now I want to execute the function. I'm the real mean, and I'm going to take the average of our object x3. Run it. Hey, we got two. It worked. Okay. So basically, what it did was it's going to run through here, and for input, it's going to say input is x3. So sum of x3 is x. That's one plus two plus three. That's six. The length of x3 is three. So then six divided by three is two, and we get our answer. Okay. Top right. Um, what do we see there? What's X, Y, and Z? X was a one to 100 vector. Y is three and Z is one to 100 as well. What the heck? Didn't I just redefine these guys? So uh, this is an important concept. Um, there are, uh, there is this thing here, which we call our global environments. Um, and there is a different environment in the world of your, um, of your function. Actually, I wonder, can you look at that? Nope. Okay. Never mind. So, um, so this is known as a local environment. So anything that happens here stays here, except for what you return out of it. So if you define anything here, um, it will not get passed to the global environments. And that's a really important concept in, in programming languages in general. Um, and that's a nice way that you can avoid sort of polluting the namespace. Um, so going back to your question earlier, when we do this type of thing, x equals x3 from like from doesn't show up there, right? Times doesn't show up there as we're defining them because what this effectively is doing is um, assigning these values in this namespace. Okay, yes. Object of input is not found. Yes. So it's running the function. So I'm giving it means, but it, then when I the like what we have in my input, when I do that, it's the input. Um, so is okay. Do you have x three up in here? Yes. You do. Interesting. Um. Object as input is not found. Um, do you have it written like this exactly? Do you have input defined up in the function, initial function area? Sweet. Yes, no problem. These things happen all the time. Um, okay. So I don't know why I always show this, but for completeness sake, we are going to do it. Um, so local environment, global environment, don't mix, but if you really want to and you can't, or if you need to and you can't figure out any way, other way to do it, there's always a different way to do it. But this is the dark side here. Okay, you can do this. 
double arrow means you pass it to the global environment. Okay. Um, so let's see what happens when I do this. Okay, rerun it. X is now six. X has been redefined, getting passed with this double caret, which allows you to, to pass things from the local environment into the global environment. Never do this. It's always a bad idea. There's always a better way to do this. Um, this is like terrible practice in basically all programming languages. Um, but if you really can't avoid it, this is how you do it. Okay, and I'll get rid of that. It's not even gonna show up in your notes. Oops, we'll save that later. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so you'll notice that I have like these squiggly brackets. Um, that's just an indicator for where the function begins and where it ends. Because you can imagine like if I don't have that, like how would the code know that X is the sum of input is part of the function I'm defining versus, oh, am I just trying to make an assignment of X is, is some input? So yeah, so those curly braces um, tell you how to separate the local environment of the function from the global environments uh, of your sort of workspace. Yeah. Uh, use the what, which function? Sample. Sample? Uh, yeah, so if you want to take, um, so if you want to take like a specific number, um, yeah, well, sample might not be the best way to do that. So, okay, so, um, so let me back up and say, like sample is meant as a way to like randomly grab objects. So I think what you, you're you asking for is maybe a little bit different because you want to point to a specific object, right? Yeah, so like say that number from right here, and I just want to pull out to the next Yes, I see. Um. Yeah, so I think what you would do is instead, yeah, I, I see what you're asking. Um, I'm trying to think of like examples. Um, like if, if I were to do that, what I would probably do is instead just pass like two to 100 even numbers into the sample and then draw from that. Um, there is another thing in sample that I didn't talk about. Um, let me go back up there. So actually, I think that's, so sample, um, x equals z, size equals 50, prob equals um, c1 rep zero comma, 49. Uh, oh, and I need to do place equals true. Maybe this is kind of what you're asking. Um, so let me run this and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to do 50 draws from Z. No. Uh, Oh, 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 whoops, I see. So I did 50 draws um, from my hat and I got one every single time. How the heck did that happen? Um, 
so this this might be the closest thing I think to what you're asking. So I can actually weight the values in the hat um, by some kind of probability, right? Um, the default probability is even. So my weight would so here it would actually be 0.01 for every number. But here I've redefined the weights to be one, or sorry, here, one for the first value and zero for the other 99. So you have a hundred percent chance of grabbing the first value, right? So I can do like I could change that. Uh, let's do 0.5 comma 0.5 and 98 here. So now I would have draws from uh, the first two values are 50 50. Okay, so if you, we wanted to do what you were asking, uh, I'm gonna, what I would wanna do is zero for all the odd values and then everything else is uniform. So the way I could do, one way I could do that is um, alternating between zero and 0.02, right? So I'm gonna do rep, um vector zero comma point oh two and i want to repeat that 50 times so if i do this correctly then i should draw 50 times out of the hat but i should only be getting even numbers so cross my fingers Cool, okay, so in this case, right, there are no odd numbers. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that's what you're asking, but what I'll say is that um, we're gonna get a little deeper into, yeah, okay, okay, good. Um, so in principle, there will be other things like uh, filtering, like if you wanna do like only even numbers, that, that sort of thing. Um, we'll look at how to do that and like real practical applications of doing that with using you know, real world data. Okay. Yes. Number 10 in the console, like the brackets, like 1, 18, and 35. 1, 18, and. Oh, yes. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I should explain these things. Uh, okay. All right. It's, it's pretty simple. Ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. There you go. And then that's the 35th value. So these uh, will tell you where you are in the vector. Uh, any other questions here? Okay. Um, let's do um oh okay one really quick other thing um so i lied about the return thing there is actually you don't always have to do it like that um we're gonna do another way of doing the mean.
Okay. So I've created another function, sum input divided by length input. Um, and then I run alternate mean for x3 and I get return two, but I didn't have a return function. Wait, how does it know to return that thing? Well, when there's only one line or when there's only like one, um, one operation, that's the only thing it'll return. So there's a shortcut. If you don't want to re write return, whatever, you can, you can do it like this too. There's shorthand, um, always better practice to do the return way, but. Okay. So the last thing that we will talk about today Maybe the last thing. Um, the if function. Um, also, uh, one of the most useful things that we could do. Um, actually, even before we talk about that, we have to do the assignment checks. Um, so I already, um, I had already mentioned one. Um, so right now we have uh, X is defined as six because we did that weird global thing before. Okay. X equals equals six. What happens? What gets returned? Sorry, what was that? True. True, great. True. Does x equal six? Yes, it does. We return true. Does x equals five? False. Great. Um, what do you guys think? True. Okay, what is this? X clam equals is uh, not equal to. So does X not equal to five? Yes, six does not equal to five, true. X is X not equal to six? False, X is equal to six. Great, pretty straightforward. Um, what do you guys think here? Is X larger than six? No, it is not. It is false. Is X greater than or equal to six? True. Okay, and so on and so forth, you get the point. Is X less than seven? It is true. Okay, so these equals equals, greater than, greater than, or equal to, less than. These are, op, uh, these, these are operators um, that can check the relationship between your left-hand side and your right-hand side. And if the relationship is true, it returns true. If the relationship is false, it returns false. Um, yeah, this I guarantee you will be using all the time in this class and probably all the time in your data analysis. Um, what are some things we can do with this? So logic operators. So, okay, let me redefine X. Oops. 10. Okay, if x so honestly the best way to think about this is just kind of logically in english Okay, I just typed a bunch of stuff here. Um, so the way if statement works is 
if true, enter into whatever is happening that I've defined. Um, if it's false, skip ahead to the next thing, right? Um, so the curly braces indicate what to do if the condition is true. Um, otherwise, it's going to skip past it. So who wants to, well, okay, who wants to tell me what happens if I run this code? It prints third, okay? And so let's walk through this like in English, right? So X is equal to 10. Um, okay, does X is, or is X less than one? No, it's not. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip everything in the first curly braces. Okay, otherwise, let's see, does X, is X less than two? Um, it is still not. So then I'm gonna skip through that and says, otherwise, just do this, okay? So else is like all other conditions, okay? So in this case, else is kind of saying um, anything that's bigger than two, well, actually, it, it doesn't even matter. It just, if you, get, if you get to the last thing, if X is not less than one and it's not less than two, then do this. So let's see if that works. And we print third, great. Um, what do you guys think will happen here? Well, okay, let's do this. Print hello, else if x is equal to 10. Print world. Great. What's going to get printed? Hello world. Any other guesses? Just hello. Yeah. So, um, so it's just going to be hello. And let me explain why. Um, oh, not that. Okay. So in elf, in sorry, elf, in if and else conditions, right, you only get to the else if you've passed over the if. Okay. Because I've done this, then it says, okay, you don't have to go any further. We're good. Okay. So you never get to world. Um, in this case, I run this. These are two separate if statements. Um, so it resets and it's like a totally separate check. And so in this case, if I run through 119 and then 122, it's going to do both of them. Okay. Um, so in the if else things, you only proceed to else if the first if isn't triggered. Um, great. Any questions about that? All righty. Let's see, I guess we can end here for today. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, call it a day. And um, yeah, we'll continue with our tutorials uh, on Thursday and actually on Tuesday next week as well um, before we dive into the data analysis portion, great. Um, so I will post this code as well as, um, so all of my lectures will have these sort of notes as well, which I'll post online um, that have more sort of description. Um, so that'll all be available on Canvas. Great.